Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Vinicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. So today we have back on the show Nick Hazelton coming in from Oregon. He is the Anarcho Yakalist, the host of the Anarcho Yakalist podcast. Uh, you can find that on Facebook as Anarcho Yakalist podcast, or on, you can find him on Twitter under Nick Hazelton, under Instagram uh, on Instagram under Nick Hazy, and on Snapchat under Nickly Pickly. He got he got fun there, uh, and <laughs> his website is an dash yak dot com a n dash yak dot com and uh we're gonna talk about we're gonna have a fun episode today just talk about a um interesting debate he had with todd lewis who calls himself a christian distributist uh, i um debated him once uh and then uh he was interested in debating nick so he, nick had an episode with him and they talked about some fascinating things so we're gonna kind of go over those topics because i think they uh are interesting topics to um, get into and uh, see what we can, you know, what can come with it. So, yeah, some of the topics he discussed in the debate were um, the idea of self ownership um, being impossible that we can't own ourselves because we own, like we, you know, we own chairs, but how can you own a chair like you own your bodies? Yeah, and then uh, abortion is murder, and then uh, animal rights and morality. Um, can you apply morality to animals? So, um, so Nick, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, and thank you for dealing with all of my uh, scheduling issues. We've, uh, I think, we've scheduled to do this at least three times, and throughout the the summer, and then um, I think we finally locked down a date in October here today, um, a couple months ago, and I almost missed it again. So yeah. I apologize, but thank you for uh, thank you for working through that with me. No problem. I know you're a busy yak farmer, and uh, a lot of people waiting for their yak meat. And uh, I don't know, do you, do you sell yak yak dairy also, yak uh, milk? I don't, not at the moment. I'd like to, but it will. It, it, it's a very lengthy process. You have to tame a yak, and and that takes a, a few years. Ah, that's so right. It'll be a while. You got to stand yeah. still. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that that makes sense. All right. Um. So so. Can you get into a little bit of background with with your debate uh, and what were your uh, initial you know thoughts of it after you did it? You know, how did you feel about it? Um, it, it was interesting. Um, I I kind of expected to have a little bit more disagreement with him, but I kind of got into it and I realized that I didn't know exactly what he was talking about. And and you know at the mostly what I could do is just say, well, I don't know. I have to get back to you, Todd. <laughs> um, on some of them, I just didn't, I didn't fully understand. I didn't study. Um, I wasn't studied up on what he said, but a lot of it, um, I, I guess I would agree from what I remember. I agreed with a lot of what he had said, um, which puts me at odds with a lot of, um, anarcho capitalists and libertarians, but um, I thought it was very interesting. It was a, a very interesting talk and we covered a lot of, stuff um we kind of just breeze through and it was a little bit fast that would be my only thing is i don't think that it was that great of uh of a debate because of how fast we went and um and the the lack of opposition he had from me um was was you know it's just too bad but it was interesting and i thought he raised a lot of great points and i thought that um he did make a lot of great points um <laughs> you know yeah i remember um with my debate also that um he would cite specific people, like specific scholars, specific philosophers, and say, you know, I agree with this one, but then this one came along and just, and uh, you know, contradicted him, and then he discovered this new thing, and then, so he was basically rattling off, I don't know, books and what other people <laughs> said, and to me, um, that's not really um, a debate. It's like he's a book in a sense, <laughs> and he's just <laughs> rattling off ideas, and I'm like, well. Okay, that's what people, other people said. I'm really interested in what you have to say, <laughs> and what you think about all this. Um, and he did. 
um, too much of that. Uh, I guess I guess you can say that's like an appeal to authority. You know, it's like we revere these people, these authors, and these these uh, thinkers and scholars, and so you know we assume that everything they say is correct. But that's not true at all. That's not the case. You know, I don't agree with a lot of with with everything that you know Stefan Molyneux says. <clears throat> I don't agree with everything that. You know, Walter Block says, I don't agree with everything that Tom would say. Um, some things I do, you know, you pick and choose. And so, um, and I think there was too much of that w- with my debate. And I think you did the same thing in your debate. And and I think, um, yeah, it's, it's just, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't like how that came across. It's like he, he, he didn't really want to talk to you about principles. He wanted to talk to you, what would this guy say? What this guy? And you're like, I don't know what he said because I didn't read that book. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I've never read Murray Rothbard, so I can't um, I can't say that I agree with him, right? I, from what I've heard, he makes a lot of sense, but I've never really read his exact statement. So yeah, it was it was kind of difficulty, uh, difficult there when. Um, and I, mean, I see where he comes from. You know, uh, if you're going to go after a philosophy, go after the people who um, who kind of founded it, I guess. But um, I, from what I got from a lot of people, it was like, yeah. Murray Rothbard said that one thing about um, abortion or whatever. I don't, mm. I don't know what exactly this was, right? But um, you know, I don't agree with that. Mm. You know, and many anarcho-capitalists would would say that, right? That's that's why I got that from a lot of people. It's like, yeah, that guy said something stupid, but that was the one thing he said that was stupid. And nobody's perfect, right? So it doesn't dismiss the whole philosophy. It just dismisses that one guy's point. Mm. And I think he's right. I think that that was a that was a a good point that a lot of people brought up afterwards is that yeah todd went after um these thinkers these anarcho-capitalists libertarian um austrian economic thinkers but you know that that doesn't dismiss the entire philosophy of anarcho-capitalism or or libertarianism yeah yeah and and i think it's actually a good thing that you find or that a person finds um some fault or some disagreement with a thinker because that tells me that the person is not just blindly believing what a person, what another scholar um, writes and says just because they wrote it and said it, right? You're actually seriously thinking about what they're saying, which is a good thing, right? Um, I would be afraid of people who would say, you know, Stefan Maunu can do no wrong, can say no wrong. You know, Larkin Rose can say no wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, that's that's idolatry. That's that's idol worship. That's, you know, the appeal to authority. And uh, that's a no-no. <laughs> that's like, that's the <laughs> antithesis of being a free thinker, being an right. ind- independent thinker. And, uh, and, you know, one of the memes that my... Uh, my friend Jim Limber Davis made, uh, which is a really awesome meme. Um, he said that um, liberty, great liberty leaders create more uh, leaders rather than followers, which I think mm-hmm. is really awesome. You know, we, we want people, you know, we're not trying to, to convey these principles so that in such a complex and intricate way that, that they, they have to, like, refer to our writing or our podcasts to explain it to people. You want people to understand it themselves so that they can explain it to other people, right? You want them to embody the principles. And uh, and so that's that's my approach and the way I write. I try to make it very clear and understandable with as little jargon as possible. And if I do mm-hmm. use jargon, uh, to explain myself, you know, clearly explain your terms. That's one of the, the very basic... Uh, very very basic foundations when i talk to anybody you know explain your terms what do you mean by capitalism what do you mean by taxation what do you mean by uh you know um exploitation or wage slavery you know <laughs> you know what do you mean by these things it's very important to uh to explain topics right what do you, what do you think i absolutely agree I, I completely agree that's that's one thing um that I really like about a, a lot of people that I see in the anarcho capitalist and libertarian community, um, maybe not so much in the in the minarchist community, where we have people like Gary Johnson and, and pe- other people in the libertarian party who are, are really looked to and, and kind of put up on a pedestal, I think. Um, but generally, um, most of the th- most of the time, I think that uh, the libertarian anarchists are pretty good at at recognizing, hey, that person said some great stuff, but I, you know, I kind of disagree with them. Uh, and a great person that pops into my head is uh, Ben Stone. He, he, the bad Quaker. He, mm-hmm. I think he embodied exactly what you're talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I really like that. Um, 
and of course defining terms that's that's the first step in in every debate right we can't mm. we can't argue um you know tech that taxation is theft if somebody for some reason defines taxation as voluntarily giving your money to mm. uh, an organization right. um, to, <laughs> to yeah. help out, right? Because we have a very, a vastly different um, definition of taxation. So, if, you know, we're not, the words are just um, kind of a, a, a brief, it, at least some terms can be, um, they're ways to describe something like a, a statement in just one word, right? So taxation would, I, I forget what it, I know I have a, a, a definition um, right off the top of my head, but um, so this is a bad example. I should, uh, so anyway, but you kind of get what I mean. It's mm -hmm. the, the map is not the territory. So taxation doesn't necessarily um, mean there's, there's words that have multiple meanings mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm just failing to come up with an example off the top of my head here. But uh, so uh, an example terms is important. An example of why taxation is theft, you mean? No, I mean why defining your terms is important and, and oh. that, um, you know, taxation means a certain amount of work, like it means a statement here, but we just shorten it down to taxation because it's easy. Well, it's a euphemism. It's a political euphemism, just like um, quantitative easing, the, the war on terror, the war on drugs, right? <laughs> just like all these yeah. things, you know, the welfare state, these are political euphemisms meant to, you know, basically um, cloak and enshroud these, these really... Um, you know, horrific things that that we do. You know, it's you know you gotta call it what it is. It's not, you know, it's not getting pulled over by a police officer. It's it's getting a death threat, right? It's not it's not getting uh it's not getting arrested. It's getting kidnapped, right? It's not getting it's not we're not paying our taxes. You know, our currency is being stolen from. <laughs> it's not it's not the war on drugs. It's a it's a war on addicted people, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's very important. To um, to call things by their proper names, right? As uh, as Confucius says, and and uh, as Mark Stevens said, it's not better than saying it's the government. You know, a government fundamentally doesn't exist. It's just people with guns forcing you to pay them, right? So you have to sh strip it down away from all these um, pleasant sounding words that um, just obfuscate reality and uh, you know clearly state things as they are. Um, so so let me ask you. Um, so with the self ownership. Um, how do you define self ownership? And, and I'll give you my definition. Sure. Um, I guess the way that I would, and this is a hard one, right? Because I just think it means you you own yourself, right? You have personal autonomy over your body and and your mind, whatever the self um, embodies, which you know I would argue would be your body and your mind, and probably just that, mm. right? You have sole dominion over that would be self ownership. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. When I talk to people about, um, you know, people I meet on the street and, um, and I kind of gently are talking, I'm talking about what I do with this podcast and the website. Um, you know, I ask, I ask them, do you feel that you are entitled to the fruits of your labor? You know, that you work for. Yeah. How much of that are you entitled to? Right. Most people say hundred percent. And I'm like, all right, so what is then taxation if you don't receive all of it? If you feel you are entitled to 100%, then a sum of it is immediately taken from you or stolen. Um, what what message is that conveying? That's conveying that these um, bureaucrats and politicians believe that they are entitled to the fruits of your labor, that in a sense that they own part of you, right? Or um, uh, some of your labor or your time and effort, right? And... Um, you know, I think it's a little bit of a stretch to call that slavery, but it is it is um, some some kind of ownership of your time. You know, just imagine, you know, in the sense we're working like three months out of the year for free, right, for the state. <laughs> and so if, if you were to have full and complete ownership over your body and the fruits of your labor, because whatever, not only your body, but you're responsible for the effects of your actions, which includes working, right? And so... Um, and so you're, you know, if you if you take that all the way, then no other person or entity or organization or state has any right or or is entitled to any of that, and therefore a state cannot exist, right? So you must be an anarchist if you truly believe that um, self ownership is 100. <laughs> percent So that's kind of a roundabout way. <laughs> that's kind. Of, that's like one of, sure. one, that's like one of the ways that I talk to people about um, about anarchy without actually mentioning the word anarchy you know 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, and then Todd, uh, you know, his, his argument with, uh, with self ownership is like, well, you can own a chair, um, and you can break the chair and you can do whatever you want. You can sell it, you can give it to somebody and, but you can't do the same thing with your body. You're not separate from your body. The mind and body is together. You're, you can't sell your body and your other part of you is over there and, you know, (laughs) um, and and some so some people I think I I remember hearing um the argument that one person made was like can we voluntarily sell ourselves uh, our bodies and I'm, I'm like yeah it's called working <laughs> you know <laughs> you sell yourself a portion of your time and labor and people pay you right um and then what about what about servitude can you voluntarily be someone's slave now I think that might be called um, BDSM. <laughs> right <clears throat> was that bondage and slave master <laughs> relationship submission, yeah yeah whatever it is right yeah. but but um even that is not fully being a slave because you can always opt out right you have a safe word so even that so so the idea is you can't voluntarily be a slave basically against your will just like you can't voluntarily a woman cannot voluntarily be raped we can't voluntarily be mugged or robbed from Right. If you're giving your money to somebody, it's charity. But woman gives her body to a man's called sex. Right. <laughs> so you can't voluntarily be a slave. <laughs> it's an involuntary act to be a slave. I, I think that it's it's an interesting idea because I, I agree with you um, by definition. Right. Slavery and rape are, are not consensual. Right. But it's it's interesting that, you know, whether you can give like a partial ownership or ownership of your body to somebody else. Um, and I, I kind of think that it's counterintuitive to give up quote unquote ownership. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, cause just by practice, I mean, you, you own your mind, right? Nobody can really, you can, you, you can kind of manipulate that, I guess, through, through words and, and, you know, other things, but it's, it's very difficult and right. And you, you have the final say in pretty much everything you do, Right. So by default, you, you do own yourself. So I think it's, it's interesting idea whether you can give that up in like um, a relationship or, you know, however you can do that. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you can really give up ownership mm-hmm. um, because I think that's kind of just something you have by default. But um, I mean, you can obviously, you know, you can put yourself into a situation where, um, you voluntarily, I guess, I don't know what, if there's a better term to, to be a slave, right? You can, you can put yourself in that situation and, uh, you know, I don't believe that you or I should have anything to do with that, right? If, if somebody else decides to do that, that's not our business. That's not where, you know, that's their decision. It's what they get to decide to do with their own self-ownership, right? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Are you done? Go, go ahead. Yeah, I think, no, I'm done. You're good. Um, yeah, but then I think that the slave would be the wrong word. Like if a, sure. if a if a woman, you know, you know, renounces worldly pleasures and devotes herself to to, you know, the church, she's called a nun, right? If a, if a if a man devout, you know, renounces world, worldly pleasures and and devotes himself to let's say Buddhism, he becomes a monk. You know, you don't really call him a slave. You know, a slave is really an involuntary thing. He's person is taken and coerced and forced to do things against his will, right? So it's just, it's, I guess it's just semantics. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. But, but it, the, you know, the idea of, of you know, what, what we mean, I think you can, we can tell the difference between what we mean by voluntarily, you know, enslaving yourself to somebody and, mm. and not, right? Mm-hmm. There's a clear difference and I don't think, and it'd be nice. We Maybe we should come up with a new word <laughs> <laughs> to describe it. But, um, you know, it, it's just, um, well, well, here, here, I have, I have an interesting thought experiment for you. Um, when does a child gain full self ownership? <laughs> that's a great, great, interesting question. <laughs> you know, that's just what me and my dad have talked about for for a long time. Um, you know, since I started kind of pushing for my own independence, you know, he's like, well, right, 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 right. You're right. Like, and he would make the argument, well, you have to do what I say because <laughs> you haven't fully homesteaded your body. 
Right? Oh, really? He like, uses those yeah, words? Uh, he he did. You know, he said you're you haven't fully homesteaded yourself. You <laughs> you can't rely on yourself. So uh, okay. I think I get to tell you what to do. And uh, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And of course, I'm like, no way, you don't. Um, I can do whatever I want. And the only reason why I'm doing what you want is because you you do feed me, which uh-huh. makes sense, right? You know, I have to. It's it's a it's a bargaining chip being uh-huh. fed and uh, <laughs> that's a nice <laughs> having thing. a house. That's a nice um, thing. Sure. Right. And so, um, I don't, I don't know. Like, it's a really good question. And uh, like 18 is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's so many people that I know that could be, um, and have been self-reliant before the age of 18. And I certainly mm-hmm. think that children deserve more freedom than they're given by the, by the state and their parents before the age of 18. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know exactly, but I, I, I would say it's probably not before 12. You know, people don't really develop um, great reasoning skills for a, a while. And I would say that, um, you know, I know a lot of people even at age 18 that probably aren't suited to live on their own. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what that is. But I guess, right. you know, for certain, I think that if you are able to prove that you can uh, live on your own, then certainly mm-hmm. I think you have. But I do think that, um, children deserve more freedom than I think a lot of people believe. So, so yeah, so one possibility is, um, it's different for different people, <laughs> right? Different yeah, people have different absolutely. maturity levels and different knowledge and different abilities, um, uh, different, you know, handicaps, right. Or strengths. Um, and, uh, so my friend Jim Limber Davis, he, he wrote, uh, books, um, uh, Liberty, De- Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. Mm. And, um, he, he takes an interesting perspective on this because I posted a lot about this, um, about you know peaceful parenting and self ownership with kids, and um, his contention. And he also he's also a parent of like an eight year old, and he's a very peaceful guy, you know, just like me. So he's very me and him agree on a lot of things. But um, one thing with with um, with this self ownership and children, he says that um, that um, when children are born, they are the complete property of the parents. Now he's like that. That might seem like um, like it, it would recoil. Like it, it may seem harsh to a lot of libertarians or anarchists to hear that. But but he says as the child gets older and older and older, they slowly claim more and more ownership over themselves, and so eventually they you know become fully independent. Uh, so in that sense, they own their children. <laughs> but I don't think I, I still think it's a strange thing to say. I own my child. Um, mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it like that. Uh, and the way that I describe that with my kids is um, I try to treat them as if they already do own themselves. You know, you know, it's like, of course, as as uh, infants and toddlers, you know, they don't know the effects of their actions. They don't know what they're doing. They're largely experimenting with the world. And and so, you know, you make decisions, you know, you know, should they experiment with this? Should they experiment with that? And of course, you don't let them. You don't let them experiment walking off a cliff, and you don't let them sure. experiment walking in a highway. So you make decisions as to what you think is appropriate for them to experiment with, and um, and they make their own mistakes and they learn, and uh, and that's how they become independent and self reliant, right? Um, and uh, and I think my kids are um, are pretty well. Um, you know, when they we go out in public. Uh, they are pretty confident and well spoken, and they speak to adults like without any trepidation. They don't speak as if the adults are the authority figures at all. They don't really recognize authority figures much, <laughs> which is wonderful. And yeah. and, uh, and 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 so when they speak to parents of other children, you know, or, yeah, the parents. When they speak to the parents, they're completely fine. But the children of of those parents don't necessarily speak to me at all you know so a lot of them um do understand that parents or adults are authority figures you don't just speak to them you know it's like it's like i don't know maybe it's like the speak when spoken to type thing you know um sure and and that's sad it's very tragic so so that yeah that's kind of the way my approach is is um i understand that there's an automatic power differential between parent and child when they're born, you know, we're bigger, older, stronger. And so as much as possible, I try to nullify that and give them the freedom to make their own mistakes, you know. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's difficult because I'm not your father, but uh, <laughs> maybe if I was, I would be a little more free and relaxed. <laughs> and I can see, you know, you're a capable guy. And, you know, so, you know, if you need my if you need my help, you know, I'll give you my help if I can help you. But if you can do things on your own. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. And and you know the other thing is um 
if you didn't have to spend all of those years learning what someone else thought was important, where would you be today, right? How Mm self-reliant would you be by now if you didn't have to waste time learning or I should say memorizing uh, things that were useless to you? I think that's the real question. All the wasted time, you know, and and I think my kids, um, because you know, with the homeschooling and the schooling, we are giving them the opportunity to do things that they enjoy. Um, I think they will be. I I completely see them, um, you know, having a business and earning an income very quickly, and that's exciting. Sure. That's exciting for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I completely agree. I think that you, know, you and I completely <laughs> completely agree on that point. You know, that's, I think that's exactly what a parent should be doing, right? I don't, I don't think it's um, as much as of a of an ownership role over a child, right? I think right. it's more of um, you know a caretaking role mm. where um, or guardian, you're, right? you're yeah, 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 you're providing for them um, until they can't, and your your job is to to work yourself out of a job. <laughs> you know, your job is to get this this right. person to be um, self reliant, and uh, and it's a it's a tricky situation because there's there's no other kind of relationship, mm. and uh, I'm not sure that you can, um, I'm not sure you can treat it as as the same as as you know your and my relationship, you know, right? You know, you and I have to completely respect our our decisions, right? That's mm. you know in you know, we work on a voluntary interaction basis and that's not like children. Mm -hmm. And of course, that doesn't mean that you can then manipulate that and and abuse that and and take ownership of this child as weaker person, right? This doesn't mean that um, you're allowed to aggress on them, right? Um, But it does mean that there's, it's it's complicated, right? And the you know, there are situations where you do have to violate the consent. Like my your kid just wants to go run out in the woods for a few days on their own. You know, mm. like they just get mad at you because you, you said something and they're mm. like, I'm running away. Right. You can't really let them do that because um, of what, you know, what, what, what would happen? You know, they, they'll they get lost. We'll get eaten by a bear or something. <laughs> you, you know, so, you know, there's situations like that. But um, t- and it's probably complicated. I'm not a parent. Right. I'm I'm pretty young and I hope not to be a parent for a little while longer. Um, you know, but right, it's, right. it's, I, I don't know exactly. It's a complicated situation that, you know, I don't think I figured it out, but I definitely think that, um, you know, I think that there are ways that you can be pretty smart about it. I think that it's kind of common sense, at least to me, that you should just let these kids, at least to, to a degree, make their own decisions. Like you're saying, let them fail, let them figure it out. You don't mm. need to be there unless they're really going to cause themselves serious harms, mm. harm, right? And you know, and you're there as a helper mostly. So, so talking about uh, letting your kids walk out into the woods, uh, you just reminded <laughs> me of something because my daughter, she's very um, fiercely emotional, um, and her yeah, her her emotional state is um, very strong, <laughs> like my wife. And uh, <laughs> so, so if you anger her, um, she will. Like say, like she has said, like I think she started this maybe a couple of months ago, where she says, um, "I'm going to go to another house and another family, and I'm leaving you." <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, as a parent, you're like, "Yeah, she's just joking." You know, <laughs> you know, nobody <laughs> believes you when your kid says that, right? And then my my son, who's six years old, he's two years older than her. She's four. Um, he is very scared like he believes her completely and he's like down on his knees crying begging saying no serena please don't leave i'm going to give you all my toys i'll I'll play with you please don't leave i'll do anything you want what do you want me to do and and so even then when he does that she still doesn't budge she's like no i'm leaving (laughs) (laughs) and and so this happened one time during the summer and uh my wife's like do something danilo so I, I said, okay, 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 calm down. Okay, what's going on? And then she's like, she wants to leave. I'm like, where are you going to go? I'm going to go to the other house. I'm like, all right, all right, just just let her go. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so so he got out of the way, and she was leaving, and she walked across. We live in like a cul-de-sac development, and she walked across the street, and um, and then she went. Uh, so I was following her. My, my son was following me. <laughs> we were all following her. And she walked on, on, went to another house, another property, walked on the driveway, walked up their stairs, walked up to the door, and knocked on the door. 
<laughs> oh man. <laughs> and uh and the only the only uh, organisms that actually answered were dogs <laughs> barking. Oh. So that was good. And then uh and then she was about to all right, I'm gonna go to the next house. <laughs> <laughs> but the, by that time my wife was there and you know but but basically what i was trying to say is i was talking to her i'm like why are you gonna do this we're gonna miss you you know why are you, what are you gonna do where are you gonna sleep you know try to reason it out with her rather than like forcefully restrain her you know mm-hmm. and try to just engage her um her mind and her reasoning capabilities and say you know how is this gonna work what if you need food do they know what food you like and you know, what if they you need to go to ballet? How are they going to take you? They, you know, we know that you like ballet, <laughs> you know, all yeah, these kind yeah. of things. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I know that, that her, um, she has very intense emotions um, and we deal with it. You know, I try to um, talk to her and reason with her and, you know, be compassionate and being a listening ear. Um, but it's hard because my son is not like that. Um, like he's not very intense at all, you know, in that way he's, uh, he's very different. So yeah. So I thought that was interesting to share. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, and there's been situations now that I think about it, you know, I ran away and I, and you know, I was being young. I didn't think all the way through it. Um, it ended up, didn't bring a sweatshirt and it was very cold outside. So, <laughs> and, uh, I just decided that, you know, I don't know where to go. I'm <laughs> right. going to go back home, you know, and it's, and it's, right, right. um, it's not fun. And, you know, I, I came back and of course I was in trouble. Um, How old I don't, I don't you? know what, uh, I bet I was like six. It's probably happened. Six. A few times. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and you know, I just ran out in the field and, you know, I was right. 20 yards away from home. Yeah. Uh, so you're mad you know, at but you, I was hidden. You were mad at your parents for something. Yeah. And I don't remember what it was or, yeah. or even what the punishment was afterwards. Oh, but, okay. um, uh, you know, but I mean, it doesn't have to be a punishment, but you, you mm. kind of know that, um, you know, that wasn't really a situation that my parents had to intervene and they didn't, uh-huh. right? They're like, yeah, no, he'll be back, right? <laughs> um, you know, that's exactly what happened. So yeah, no, I, that makes sense now that I think about it. You know, maybe that's not a situation, but I think that it's, it's usually pretty clear. I think what you did is great, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. you don't have to grab a kid and bring her back in and say, and, and then, because what would you do then? You would explain to her, no, you can't do that because of this and this and this. Instead, yeah. you know, just let her do it. Instead, let her do it, yeah, and, and then talk to her as she's doing it. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, as much as possible, try to reason. So, yeah. that's, maybe it would be different if we did live out in a field. <laughs> we didn't have so many people around us that, that, you know, if she's screaming that, you know, people would think we're beating her, you know. but Yeah. Because she does have a really loud voice, I'm telling you. This four-year-old, she's, <laughs> she's tiny, but she has a loud voice. So, and I've been having to tell her multiple times, you know, when she screams for very little things, you know. I don't know. Marcus takes a toy. She screams loud, ear-piercing scream like she's being attacked by somebody. Oh, like somebody's beating her up. That kind of scream. I'm like, you can't scream like that. People call the police. They call the road pirates. Don't do not do that. <laughs> yeah. They're going to take you away. You're not oh, going to see anybody goodness. again. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that's – and. From what I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm able to reflect on on my parenting and how I was parented, um, and how I'm an adult. I guess I I forget that um, <laughs> I'm seen as an adult by the, the state and uh, right. and most people now. But you know, I look back and I think about you know how was I parented and and I still live with my parents, right? I'm still um, and I still have my obligations, household obligations that I've always had, right? I, I have my my chores, mm. and uh, you know, I I think back, and and now I I you know I I'm making a conscious decision decision to um to be more grateful for what I have and that they let me live here and and you know what they've done for me, right? Because you know t- truly, my parents have been one of the greatest blessings I have. They've been they've made my life difficult in some ways, but um. You know, overall, right? I think that they've been some of my greatest supporters. Um, but you know, I think about it like, um, you know, I, my forever, my parents are always like, "You got to do these certain things," and uh, they get so mad when I forget about them. Right? They give me three things, and and just the way my mind works, I'm not good at at remembering it. Mm. And so they, you know, they yell at me, "Hey, Nick, you got to do this." And I'm mm. like, "Oh yeah, 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 okay." And <laughs> and there's other things like that, right? They say you have to do these things, and they get mad. Why don't you do this? And, uh, you know, I go back through, I'm like, well, you've been telling this to me for 17, 18 years. Mm. And why haven't I gotten it by now? Mm. And why am I only getting it just now? It's, well, I think it's because, right, you you haven't really respected my, um, 
decision-making skills, mm. right? You tell me you have to do this and, uh, to, and, and nobody's like, oh, I love authority, right? Mm. I'm going to do that, right? Mm. And that, nobody really starts out like that, at least most people. It seems like most kids um, start out being pretty defiant, right? right? Like mm-hmm. they're going to put up a fit because you're making mm-hmm. them do something they don't want to do. Right, right. Um, and, and, you know, what you do that from there is you punish them when they, mm-hmm. when they don't do what you want to do. So you get, so the kid has this negative reaction to mm-hmm. um, hearing you tell them, you know, do this. And you can see this in a lot of people. I can see this in my sister. She's very... Um, she's actually even more like, um, I guess sassy than I am, (laughs) you know, you tell her to do something and she's like, no way, I'm not doing it. (laughs) She gets mad. Right. And so like, you know, you put her in timeout so many times when she was 12, why didn't that work? I don't know. know. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I found is you really, you, or at least in my experience, it seems to me, um, that the best way to, to, to handle those things is say like, Hey, I'd like you to help out because, um, you know, we all live in this house. Like my mom works all day. She's a she's full time job, and at and at some points in my in my life, my dad's had a full time job. Right? They can't be there um, the whole time, so they need help. You know, mm. and say that. You know, hey, I need some help, and I'd really appreciate it if you do that because um, I'm out earning a paycheck so that you can eat and live in this house, mm. right? And so I I'm expecting that you put up you know part of a, an end of this bargain, right? And say that. Um, you know, I would like you to, to wash the dishes for me. That would, could you do that? Mm-hmm. And uh, if I say no, then I guess I don't, I don't know exactly. I'll let you throw in there, but it doesn't seem that, um, putting a kid in timeout or yelling at them has been effective. Mm-hmm. Um, at least with, um, the cases that I have observed, which aren't terrible amount, but mm. that'd be my experience. So I wonder, um, so that, that's, that's what I would say is this doesn't work. Um, but do you have something that does work? You know, I'm, I'm just curious. Your kids are kind of young. They're not really washing dishes, I assume. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that brings up another interesting topic about parenting, which is chores. Um, because I've interviewed a lot of, a lot of parents who, you know, preschool parents and, uh, and are homeschoolers and unschoolers. And, um, you know, sometimes they say that, uh, they don't do chores, you know, they don't necessarily ask their kids to help and they would like their kids to help because they want to help, not because mm-hmm. they have to help, right? And um, and a, a couple of them says, you know, of course they don't even tell them, you know, their room. Like like to to these parents, the child's room is their sanctuary, you know, and that's if they have however they want to have the room, that's how they have the room, you know. So so you can never, according to them, f- um, you know, force them to to clean their room and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about that now more and more, and I I, I kind of like that, you know. Um, I I I wanted that that's going to be my goal, is um is not to come at parenting from a position of authority, like you said, and tell your kids you have to do this, but just ask, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. as you would as you would like a friend, like a peer, you know, you wouldn't tell your 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 friend clean my dishes <laughs> you know <laughs> you would ask you know like you know help me out we're, we're let's let's talk while we're while we're cleaning or you know like i'm talking to my brother sometimes downstairs and i'm making guacamole and i'm like yeah can, can you and he's just listening to what i'm saying and i'm making the guacamole i'm like nick why don't you just oh he's also nick yeah <laughs> sure. i'm like sure. nick, nick nick uh you know chop this onion or this uh this uh this uh tomato and he's like all right <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so it's not like chop it now you know <laughs> mm-hmm. so um i think that's gonna be my goal you know i, I don't like this word chores no no i definitely don't yeah i agree i don't think that it's you know, it it has that. Um, it definitely has that authoritarian. Right, um, definitely does. I get what do you call that. What's that a uh, word? Um, tinged. I don't know. It's right, not right. tinged, but yeah. it's flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess that's just what it is. Um, yeah. So yeah, I agree. I, I think that's great, and I'm, you know, that's what I would, you know, when and if I have kids, like that's the way I would like to do it. Right. That's because mm-hmm. like we go back to it. Um, like what we've said, it's you know. I, you know, what I've said is I don't think it's exactly, you don't treat kids like you in the same relationship as maybe your, your brother or your friends. Um, I, cause I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, mm. but, um, you know, your job is to make it that way. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that's the goal. And, uh, and you know, having an authoritarian, um, a position over your kids isn't going to do that. It's in, you know, I, I, by all pretty much empirical standards that I can tell, mm-hmm. um, you know, most people don't 
seem to like their parents until they're older. Mm -hmm. That's just been the way I've seen it. And I, and I guess maybe it's not most, but a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of disturbing to me. Like, what, you know, these are the people who brought you into this world. They've, Mm -hmm. they've hopefully taken care of you, um, until you were of age to take care of your own self. So Mm -hmm. what do you have this issues with them? Mm -hmm. And like, I hear this all the time. I don't know if it's 50% or less or more, but it seems that there are a lot of people who just have issues with their parents. And, and I wonder, you know, what's the deal here? You know, is it the kid? And like, because they're just a brat. They're just in that way. The parents couldn't um, find a way to correct or, or change that behavior. Um, or is it because these parents did something to this child um, that they didn't appreciate? And um, from what I can tell, it typically is is the latter. Right, right. And, and, and that brings to mind um, another idea that I, I just thought of, which is, um, you know, when, when you said that, your parents, you know, they say, I bring in the paycheck. And so I expect you to do certain things. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and the way I look at it is that, you know, we chose to be parents, but our children did not choose to be our children. Right. It's completely accidental, completely, uh, involuntary, you can say. Um, whereas being parents is, off most of the time, completely a voluntary decision, right? And so mm-hmm. in that case, it's what you would call an acquired obligation, right? So you can't, like, you know, have children because you want slaves. <laughs> you yeah, know, because right. they, didn't choose, they didn't choose to be in that position, right? You made the choice. So therefore, you have an acquired obligation to these children to take care of them, feed them, nurse them, and clothe them and house them until they can take care of themselves, right? And so, and after that, they don't owe you anything. Like, like this is actually another topic that's very interesting. I brought up with the, the other mothers in my group, which is, um, do your kids owe you anything after they leave the house, right? Um, because um, my mother asked me this uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and, um, and the reason she asked me this is because um, some football player made like, I don't know, makes like millions of dollars a year, and, uh, and then the mother makes like a public statement saying, well, I'm your mother. So I, 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 um, I deserve half of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings to light an interesting idea, an interesting concept, which is, um, you know, do we owe our parents until our death, right? For taking care of us and giving us life and nourishing us and all that. And I don't think we do. I, I think that, um, because our children did not choose to be our children, we are the ones with the acquired obligation, right? It's our obligation. It's our duty to take care of them. And once we have done that, we are, there's no debt at all. No repayment needs to be done. Everything is equal, you know? Uh, we brought about the inequality by bringing this this being into existence that is completely dependent on us, right? Um, mm-hmm. In the same way that um, <laughs> Tom Woods makes an interesting analogy to explain this concept, which is, you know, if a... Um, if a, uh, a an airplane pilot, you know, goes up in the air with, with like I don't know, hundred passengers, and then, uh, <laughs> and then he, and then he says to one of a, one passenger that he doesn't like, "I don't like you. This plane is my property. Get off my property." <laughs> <laughs> it's like twenty thousand feet in the air, and then and then he's, and then you know the libertarian was like, "Hey, it's his private property. You gotta do what he says. <laughs> if he wants you off his property, you gotta get off his property." <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. But again, it's it's the case of an acquired obligation, right? You're putting the people, the passengers, in a state of vulnerability um, by uh, you know them buying the ticket, then they getting on your aircraft. Now, now it's your duty to take them. You, you put them in a vulnerable situation and get them safely to where they're going, <laughs> right? So yeah, I find that to be um, analogous. Those two things. What do you think? Oh, I I completely agree. I think that that's. Um exactly how you should treat it. Um, and uh, so, I, yeah, I guess I don't have anything else to add to that. I think that's just it. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so we think we hashed that to death. So, um, let's see. Uh, well, okay. We have the abortion, but I think of more interesting, the animal rights is, uh, animal rights and morality. So, so where do you stand sure. on that? What do you think about animal rights? Given the fact that you're a yak farmer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I've had some run-ins with, I guess, maybe I wouldn't call them activists, but people who promote animal rights. Um, actually, two of, of my close romantic relationships have been with people who, at least one of them was was 
pretty much in opposition to to farming and mm. that um you know that led to a, a strain right because i'm i'm totally opposed to to veganism and i and that gave me an opportunity to study it i guess um which is, that's why i brought that up um because uh, i i had these close relationships and i wanted to find out you know why do these people believe that and uh this is totally at odds with i what i believe this you know my livelihood is uh um uh, what do you call that? It, well, putting animals into my servitude, right? Mm -hmm. um, these these pigs are pretty much my slaves. You know, I I eventually I harvest them, and uh, you know I'm gonna do pretty much everything in my power to to, to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so I'm of course opposed to that. Otherwise, I'd be a a, a terrible hypocrite. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, I, but from what I can understand, the, the most common, you know, belief is that sentient beings should be given the same amount of rights. And in my opinion, I'd say that, well, I disagree. I think that rational beings should be given the same amount of rights. Um, and I may not have a consistent way of explaining my take on this, but, um, it's just, it's, it's my opinion that, um, animals don't deserve the same, um, uh, guidelines that I give humans, right? I'm not going to, um, aggress on humans, but I think that uh, just the way nature has come about, um, I don't. Th I think that it's very natural. I think that, um, of course, human beings maybe not don't need um, meat to survive, but uh, to be a healthy human being, I do believe that you should have animal-based protein in your diet. Um, and from what I can tell, um, that's a, that's a, something most um, medical and uh, health nutrition uh, professionals do agree with and um, so that would be my take is I think that it, you, you you should eat meat because it's healthy for you and I don't think animals deserve um, the same rights as people because I don't think that they're rational and uh, I just don't see any reason why um, just because they're sentient they should that would be my position all right, so I just lost all my vegan uh, anarchist subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You're welcome. You don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, so, <laughs> so let me state um, clearly before I respond. Um, um, I have a lot of vegan anarchist friends, and um, I'm not a vegan myself. Um, and and you know I think I think for for well just talking about the idea of of advancing you know anarchy and voluntarism and and freedom, I think it's so much more important to focus on human beings um, <laughs> than animals. Um, I think that's the more pressing issue at the moment. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, wars, imperialism, you know, counterfeiting, you know, <laughs> all the stuff that's going on. You know, sure. I think that uh, we have to put priorities. Um, uh, you know, so that's the first thing. So, so that's basically why I don't, I don't really, um, you know, like to, um, pick fights with like, you know, vegan anarchists or anarcho feminists or anarcho mutualists or an an even anarcho communists. I don't really like to pick fights with them because if they're anarchists, then they basically want the same thing I do, you know, as long as they're peaceful, basically. Um, sure. right. And, and so, you know, so I, I don't see a reason why we should do have all this infighting and just like, you know, attack each other because we don't agree on every minutia of our philosophy. Um, yeah, I just find that to be counterproductive. So that being said, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not a vegan and, um, I, uh, I, I actually, um, I have I have uh, become more intimately understanding of uh, I have understood the the idea of veganism more because my brother he's uh, 24 he just recently uh, became vegan maybe a few months ago and so he's been doing extensive study into because you know he also um, listens to a lot of what I say and you you would, you would call him a libertarian or you know you know he's 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 learning all this stuff as I'm as I'm writing and I do my do my podcast we get into a lot of interesting conversations so he learns so he understands a lot of it, a, lot, a lot of the stuff he agrees with me um and then he became a vegan and um and he's definitely not the kind of vegan which is like you know constantly um trying to make meat eaters feel bad or like you know make you feel like you're murdering um animals you know um, which is great <laughs> because yeah. uh, he's the only vegan in the house. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, so we've gotten to very interesting conversations and, and as a result of being a vegan, he's also really studied the logical fallacies because when people talk to him, he likes to be very careful about how he responds and also so that he can 
identify logical fallacies that other people commit when they attack his veganism. So that's really cool. So so we're both mm-hmm. like we're, me and him. We're both really um, keen on logical fallacies. That's how I. That's, that's a lot of the stuff. Part part of the uh, ways that I respond to people when they talk to me. I know about morality and economics and um, and uh, the state. So I use them a lot. Um, but yeah, one thing that w- when when he really started getting into it. Um, one thing that I uh, recoiled at was the idea of associating murder with animals, right? Because, um, you know, the first thing is, well, w- you know, how if you're going to say an an- killing an animal is murder, like how small of an animal are you willing to go to call a person who kills that animal a murderer? And if that's true, then every farmer is a murderer and should be treated exactly the same way as someone who murders a human being. And mm-hmm. are you prepared to do that? Like say that every farmer should be in prison because they murdered a cow or a goat or a sheep or a pig, you know? And um, I just think that's um, ridiculous. <laughs> you can't say that. Um, it's it's completely not the case. And, and I think that m- the concept of morality is specifically... Um, associated with human beings, you know, very specifically with human beings. Um, otherwise, you know, things just get all complicated. You know, you know how you know is is swatting a mosquito on my arm is that murder? Like, <laughs> is accidentally mm-hmm. stepping on ants is that murder? You know, so it just gets ridiculous and absurd. And so, um, yeah, so I think it's very important to again, you know, clearly define our terms. You know, murder is associated with with. Um, you know, with people, right? Morality is specifically associated with people um, who have um, what you call in, in uh, you know, uh, you, you know, we act, you know, human beings act. We have purposeful action, um, you know, because we are sentient, reasoning beings, right? We have a mind, and we can clearly plan for the future, right? Animals don't necessarily clearly plan. I mean, I guess you can say, you know, birds make nests and everything, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> But they they don't really think about the future. Maybe it's maybe that's just instinct. I don't know. You know, spiders build a web because of instinct, not because they're planning, in the sense that we plan. You know, when when we're uh, you know buying precious metals because there's going to be a boom bust cycle. The Federal Reserve's going, uh, you know, yeah, gonna, yeah. it's going gonna to be a recession. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? So, so yeah. So that was the first major thing, and and then and he understood where I was coming from, and he conceded that he's like, "You're right. We cannot call that murder." And, uh, you know, murder is a very specific, very harsh thing. And to say that somebody, when you kill an animal, you're a murderer is to devalue the word murder, right? In the same way that uh, when, you know, a school campus is, you know, with their PC culture and social justice warrior crap and, and they call like every guy a rapist, right? That devalues the word rape, right? Because mm-hmm. rape is a very violent and aggressive action, Right. Um, and uh, I, I don't know any any people who would who would um, you know condone or pardon rape, right? <laughs> but then to say, could turn around, the feminists turn around and say, "Well, we live in rape culture, rape all over the place." All right, come on, calm down, calm down. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's not let's not overuse and devalue these words. These are very specific words with very specific meanings, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think the same thing can be applied to animals. So, so yeah, morality for me is just uh just applied to animals uh sorry it's just applied to humans um <laughs> and and um but then at the same time i would say that um i think there is there is really you know um you know there's like killing animals for no particular reason you know and then there's killing mm-hmm. animals you know because you're a farmer or maybe because you're a hunter Right. I think there's a very big difference. Like I remember Larkin Rose was saying this, like it's not immoral to torture kittens. Right. That's, it, it, you, you can't you can't you can't you can't uh, assign that kind of, um, you know, category or that kind of label on that action. You're just being an idiot. You're just being <laughs> you're, just, <laughs> you're just being a bad person. You just you're not necessarily immoral. You don't necessarily have to go to prison. You, know, you shouldn't pay anybody. Maybe if if somebody owns that kitten, ah, see that's, that's another interesting op, uh, that's another interesting <clears throat> idea, which uh, Walter Block frequently brings up, which is really awesome. You know, you know Walter Block is famous for saying, you know, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize. <laughs> so privatize everything, right? <laughs> including including all land, 
all oceans, all animals, right? And if you really are an environmentalist and you care for animals, you want to protect them, then privatize them. Oh, you know, have ownership over them. Like, what? What is the reason that the bison? Is it the bison or the buffalo that almost went extinct? I, I keep forgetting. Uh, aren't they the same? I don't know I the don't difference. Know. <laughs> I think yeah. buffaloes like tamed and bison aren't. I don't know all what right, the deal all right. is. All right. So one of them almost went extinct, right? When you know the Native Americans, you know, hunting them down, and then and then they got the guns, and then you know from the. Uh, the Europeans or the people living here, and then and then you know they were better able to to kill them, and so they were almost like pretty much going extinct until people basically started um, taking care of them like farmers, right? Um, mm -hmm. Animal husbandry, and and then their numbers um, grew again, right? So so having ownership over animals, I think, is one of the best ways that you can save species. Um, you know, and, and the same thing goes in Africa. You know. Um, you know, you have like state protected lands or something, but then, then, you know, you have the illegal poachers and they go in there and, you know, so, so, so basically the state doesn't prevent anything, you know, <laughs> if people want to mm -hmm. go in there and kill these things and sell them on the black market, they're going to find a way to do it. Right. The state's not going to say it's not, state's not going to protect anything. You really want to protect wildlife. You really want to protect the ocean. Make it private, privatize it, privatize the ocean, privatize all land. Right. So. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's my rant. <laughs> sure, I mean, and to bring this up, uh, you know, the one of the best things for preserving um, elephants and rhinoceros, you know, these these uh, very valuable animals. People, you know, poachers hunt them for ivory, but mm. the, one of the best things for the conservation of those animals is private hunting reserves, where you can mm. pay fifteen thousand dollars to go uh, shoot Cecil the lion or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. you know. A lot of people get outraged by that because, I mean, this is an endangered species. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is, is if you can find a way to make money off breeding these animals and keeping them alive, exactly, um, yeah. it's going to happen, right? Exactly. So what you see in, in those state-run uh, preserves, uh, poachers get through that pretty easily. But the private reserves who, you know, they get these rich uh, people to come in and hunt these animals for, you know, big, big dollars. They can spend that on security mm -hmm. and keeping those poachers out. So and, and this is from what I've done from the research I have seen mm -hmm. like that. This has been the most successful um, way of, of preserving these um, endangered animals, especially in Africa. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great thing to bring up. That's true. Um when you when you privatize something, you the person who owns that land or those animals have a vested interest in making sure there's a future. Why like why would they why would they privatize something just to destroy it? Like very few people would do that. Maybe you know maybe some people would want to make a I don't know a garbage dump, <laughs> have a sure. private garbage dump. But most people when they have private property, they want to take care of it and tend to it so that they have a future. You know a future. Um, income future cash flow right you, you don't want to run your private property into the ground <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah absolutely so so yeah, yeah. so def definitely um yeah private um pr private poaching private animal hus husbandry you know um farming is not immoral and um and and oh yeah by the way you know i just want to mention uh jerry one or uh jared howe as he's known on facebook is a uh, is a very vocal veganist vegan and uh and uh, he accepts that idea that that um that uh killing animals is not murder right but he is also a vegan right so so he understands that so you know you can you can be a vegan on other grounds other than the idea that <laughs> killing animals is murder you can just say well i think it's healthier to eat more plants okay that's fine you know it's your choice we all have our choice how we want to live our lives right so <laughs> mhm mm yeah, I don't know how much how much time do we have here? Do you, do we want to stop anytime soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're almost uh, we're almost done. Um, you want like to say one more thing about vegans? If yeah, we go can. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So I I mean I'm I'm very harsh on on vegans and, and animal rights activists and and part of it is right I have this emotional attachment to eating meat and uh, preserving that tradition um, because that's how I make my money. Um, but um, you know, I. I genuinely respect people who take their ethics seriously and take their principles seriously um and especially people who you know if if you believe meat is murder and you decide i'm not going to eat meat anymore you know i'm i respect that in a lot of ways I, I don't think that it's um very wise and i don't agree with that decision but you know it's your choice and if you're willing to do that to yourself that's that's great 
um, and that you consider ethics that highly, um, I, I'm going to have more respect for that person for sure. Um, but like the main beef I have is with, um, it's not all vegans, right? <laughs> Maybe beef. Yeah, Maybe beef. Like yeah. <laughs> um, I like that. So my, yeah, my main issue is is uh, it's kind of the similar thing I have with feminism is that I don't like the the very vocal um, people who are so aggressive towards those who disagree with them. Um, I have a business partner, and actually the way I, I met him, he's um, Tyler Boggs of Heart to Heart Farms. He had a run in with uh, an animal right activist animal rights activist group mm. online, and uh, they're very very mean mm. um you know go so going so far as uh making death threats and and actually studying the layout of their farm and then sending him details on how we will come and invade you is what wow. from what i understood maybe I, I probably should stop there because i haven't read the transcripts of any of this stuff and yeah. i don't know if this is this is how far it went but that's the way he made it sound and i have an episode on my podcast it's 30 or 40 something i don't know but um from my experience and just watching these people um uh, interact with with people. I I really disagree with the methods, right? Because uh, I'm I'm very invested in animal welfare, right? I'm a, I'm a small farmer. I'm very uh, opposed to factory farming and the treatment that a lot of um, uh, livestock are given, right? Mm. I don't think that it's mm -hmm. I think it's very cruel. I don't mm. think that you should be raising pigs um, in a situation where they're getting sick all the time, so you have to pump them full of antibiotics and they're right, uh, right. eating each other's ears and tails because they're so crowded. Right. And uh, you know, having pumping them full of all these stuff that's not good for them. I, mm. I think that's really disgusting. Mm. And so I, I definitely agree with where a lot of these people are coming from, where a lot of vegans are coming from. Mm. Um, with the, the, there's genuine concerns and issues that are happening you know my, my main issue is that i i feel like i get attacked because um you know i'm not going all the way right i, I feel like um you know and, and this isn't most vegans i don't think right this is just the most of the people i interact with it seems mm. um you know this isn't what they're all doing and i think a lot of people get this is it you know we should be supporting um small agriculture because of the benefit that it does for animals. Yes, we're harvesting them eventually, but it's the best life that they can have, mm. uh, including in being in nature. You know, we, uh, these pigs have like the least stressful life in the world. Like their life is way better than mine. <laughs> that's very short. Um, right, right. but, uh, you know, they get to be free, um, mm. to an extent. So that's, that would be my main issue is that, you know, I, I get the idea, um, um, with, uh, you know, at least, most of it right and i'm and i'm working towards most of the same goals i just don't take it as far as they do and and you can call me a minarchist for that but uh you know <laughs> that's just my position is i've just found that it's um that, you know I, I genuinely respect that and i'm gonna be mean to vegans because i think it's fun and uh <laughs> and it's, i just love making people you know pissing people off but you know I, I get where they're coming from i think there are um very valuable concerns uh, that they raise, and I think that it's an interesting discussion, and uh, I, you know, I'm very open to to talking about it with them. And I, you know, personally, I have a a, a disagreement in the philosophy. And uh, if somebody would like to try me on that sometime, I welcome you to contact me, and uh, I will explain to you why I think that the fundamentals of of uh, animal rights activism and veganism, from an ethical perspective, are not um, not sound in their philosophy. So with that, yeah, that's yeah. all I have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just reminded me of uh, of something, an analogy, uh, which is it seems to me that um, when a lot of people, you know, when we talk about um, private enterprise, um, you know, privatizing things and, and how much more superior that is to state, state-run institutions, um, uh, so they equate some of them when like let's say communists, let's say they hate business, right? Because it seems like they look at Monsanto, DuPont, and... Um, you know, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you know, Halliburton. They look at all these things, all these huge corporations with massive political ties and lobbyists and bribery and corruption and all that. And and then they look at the small little food truck or mom and pop shop <laughs> and they're like, business is evil. doesn't matter how big yeah. it is, you know. And, and I draw the analogy with you and the factory farms, which again – are massive what like Tyson and Purdue those kinds of right yeah. big uh, big factory farm corporations and and the political connections the political lobbies all the the bribery corruption that goes on the revolving door with the CEOs and all that you know and then they 
they say you're the same as that. They equate you mm -hmm. with that. And it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, va they, vastly they, different. Yeah, they can't they can't draw a distinction. It's pretty amazing. So um I, I just I just kind of realized that. So it's uh yeah, yeah. It's a big, big difference. <laughs> Very important to draw a distinction there. Um so do you wanna do you wanna do a quick thing about uh abortion as murder or do you wanna or do you want to call sure. it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go for it. This is this is not a topic I typically touch on, um, because I honestly I don't really know whether abortion is murder or not. It's a it's a complicated argument, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure exactly where I stand on it. Um, I kind of take the position of uh, I don't really have to ever make that decision, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> right? True. To yeah, abort exactly. somebody. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, if I'm stupid enough to impregnate a woman, or you know, or I guess um, if you know, I, there's a possibility that I could be raped or something, you know, and, and this right. uh, and somebody sure. has my child and That's against true. my consent. Right. Um, I would like to think that I would I would take the position that no, I I will I will help raise this child. No, in either way, if you know, if somebody rapes me, I'm 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 gonna be least likely. That's a different situation, but um, I'm not sure exactly what I would do there. But I think that it generally, um, in any case, that it would be most likely. Um, I would I would like to take the responsibility, and uh, if if the woman dis disagrees with me and says no, I don't want to do this, I I would respect that decision. You can call me a cold, heartless baby killer, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's just I guess that I don't I don't know, so I'm not yeah. willing to take a, an ethical action except if um, you know, if I if I do something, I think it's my responsibility to to live up to that, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just not I don't I just don't see a case where it is really my decision. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. So, so you know, similar to the animal rights thing, um, I don't see it as a priority for me, um, which is why I don't talk about it at all <laughs> on my yeah. uh, channel and on my videos. I just don't think it, that uh, it's necessary, and um, there's more pressing issues to discuss <laughs> that we should uh, tend to. Um, and and also so so i think i think again it goes back to children and and uh you know whether the pregnancy was um how do you say intentional right you sure. know it's acquired obligation right a woman gets pregnant and um and yeah really i guess you you know i could see the case where you know it's her body it's her property she can choose to do what she wants um there's that case and and that's that's interesting and then there's another case where i see um which is um all of us are alive um because our parents did not abort us right so we are all grateful to be alive so therefore it 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 is incumbent on us or i guess on women <laughs> to yeah. um give that same gift of life to the next generation um and so, so for somebody to actively um, support abortion, I don't know. I don't know if people actually support abortion, but but um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't like say it's a crime. You know, abortion is a crime. Is murder definitely not murder? Um, but um, but yeah, that's all I would say is that you know if if you're um, you know if you're living and and you appreciate your life, which most people do, then I think it's only it's only um how you say charitable and generous to extend that same sort of life that same life gift of life to it uh, you know the next generation to to your children and and um you know and and yeah and i think it's i think you know having babies is a wonderful thing um i mean i guess you could also say well you know there's so many um there's so many children that are without parents and why are you going to just add another one to it and um yeah, I guess you could, you know, and then you just, then you just adopt. But some people don't want to adopt, so you have your own kid. Um, so you know, you know, to each his own. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's my position: is that uh, life is a beautiful thing, and um, spread it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So that's my uh, that's my thing. All right. So um, uh, so if, so why don't you um, say any last remarks you have and uh and then uh you know where people can contact you if they want to uh follow you, more of your work yeah absolutely i mean it's a pleasure to be on the peaceful anarchism show again and uh this will of course be featured on anarcho-yakitalism as well 
if you'd like to contact me, you can go to my website, an-yak.com, an-yak.com. Uh, make sure you put the dash in there. Otherwise, you will get to a Russian models uh, website, Facebook page. Really? Or maybe don't. Maybe oh, maybe nice. just throw out the – it might be interesting. She's pretty. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any nudity. But, uh, you got a competition. All right. All right. I know. I was really upset when I found that anyak.com was taken oh. by this Russian model named uh, Anyak or something. I don't know. But anyway – um, and com. you can find my contact information there. You can email me. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram and Snapchat. Um, uh, I don't want to list all those. If you would really like to follow me on any of those and you can't find me, then uh, just send me a message on Facebook. And if you add me on Facebook, please let me know. Like, um, Introduce yourself because I have so many people that add me and um, – I always wonder who are who are you? Are you like why? How do you know me? Um, <laughs> so please do that. But uh, yeah, and if you'd like to talk about anything, um, uh, generally I'm pretty busy, so I don't like to do much online. But if you'd like to come on Skype and uh, do a show with me or something, then uh, typically I'm 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 very willing and I'm willing to uh, test out my ideas. So uh, yeah, find me, uh, listen to my show, and uh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah. yeah, no problem. So, so if um, if a Russian model with the name Anyak uh, <laughs> adds you with no mutual friends on Facebook, you're gonna not accept, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it depends on what she looks like. Depends, depends. <laughs> do you like? Do you really like yaks? So she might be a fed. <laughs> right. Um, so I don't know. Maybe all right. We'll do this again. I don't know. Um, what's your favorite quote? <laughs> I know I, I asked you this last time. Oh, but sure. I do this with everybody every time, so I'm not gonna spare you, of course. Um, so m- m- maybe your favorite quote changed from last time. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it probably has. I don't remember what my favorite quote was last time, and now I think about. It. I had. I've been thinking. I was thinking about one recently that I really liked, but um, I think I'm forgetting it. So I, I would just throw out. I really like the Victor Frankel quote, and I, this is probably the quote I hear most of the time because I listen to a lot of the School Sucks podcast, and uh, their uh, main quote is, um, oh, "What is it? This there's a space in between." I'm probably butchering this. There's a space in between um, stimulus and response, and that is free will. So I like that quote because I like the idea of of widening that space, and that's kind of what Brett Panot kind of pushes on his show is widening the space and i really like that so that would be my favorite one by Beautiful. Victor, Beautiful. Victor, whatever his name is victor frankel right mm-hmm. yeah right awesome well thank you very much um nick for a wonderful conversation uh really interesting talking about these topics that i, I don't usually discuss these topics so um yeah yeah, really, really awesome. Um, so yeah, if you want to follow me, um, you know, you, or you want to donate to me, you can do so on um, Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefinarchism to follow me. Um, a dollar a show is all I ask. Um, these are free. I do this for free. But as we know in economics, uh, there's opportunity cost to everything we do. Nothing is actually free, right? So if I'm not doing this, if I'm not, if I'm doing this, I'm not doing something else. So, um, so yeah, if you find value, please... Uh, trade value for value and uh, send some uh, send some love my way um, either Bitcoin or PayPal or Patreon uh, anything that's appreciated if you want to mail gold and silver be my guest uh, <laughs> so or, or you can also um, um, click on the um, Amazon affiliate links on my website and make your purchases there uh, through those links and um, I will get a commission at no extra cost to you so it helped me doing what I do best which is interviewing fascinating people like Nick here um, and, uh, and I want to do more of it. So, um, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged. So, uh, yeah, Nick, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. So this is Peace Flanarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. 
if you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook, under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.